Well, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, very much Julia and uh, Jeff uh, McCracken Houston. Uh, if Jack Halliday is here, yes, Jack, I wanted to thank you very much for being um, battling with algorithms for many weeks and coming out on top. Uh, and it's a great delight to be uh, not for the first time before Fabians. Uh, I did live for quite a while in London and uh, did some talks for the Fabians there. Um, an organization with an, an astonishing history, named as you may know after Fabius Maximus, that general uh, whose um, motto was, you know, go slowly, delay. And uh, uh, a body that, as you know, has attracted premiers in Australia, um, at least four prime ministers. And I have to say that um, one of my mentors, Bernard Crick, was very active for many years in the Fabians. And one of my teachers, um, C.B. McPherson, who was, when I was young, a hundred years ago, was really the doyen of, of writers on democracy, was also at the LSE and involved in uh, the Fabian Society, which, as you may know, the LSE uh, was founded by uh, the Fabians. Um, since this is um, either a funeral or perhaps an accident and emergency ward meeting, um, the subject being is democracy dying, I thought just to set the scene that I would say, um, I would tell you a joke that is now 15 years old um, in times that were much happier. And it's a joke that I, during my field work for this book, came across in Athens. Um, and it's a story of, of two uh, employees in a company who are having a cup of coffee and it's just a few months before the Olympics, the 2004 Olympics and um, they're chatting and one of them says I'm so proud to be Greek and to be an Athenian. You know we, we are hosting the Olympics, look at the way the city has been transformed. You know we are, we are actually the cradle of the West and we invented democracy here. And the other one, looking a bit unconvinced, says, did you mention democracy? Yes. What do you mean by democracy? Are you sure? The other employee says, democracy is like this. You've had a hard day at the office, and you, it's pouring with rain, and you're waiting at the bus stop, and who should pull up but the boss in his BMW? And winds down his window and says, you look cold. Uh, please, come in. May I offer you a lift? Off they go. And while driving, the boss says, you are shivering. Um, come to my house. Um, I have some dry clothes for you. Sit in front of my fire. And uh, would you like a metaxa? Would you like a brandy? And the other employee looks very skeptical and says, and so the employee says, this is democracy. It's equality. The other employee says, democracy? Really? Did this ever happen to you? And the other employee says, no, but it happened to my sister. Well, once upon a time, that joke, um, a Greek joke, you know, was funny. Uh, that joke in Athens uh, today is no longer funny. It is a country, as you know, whose middle class was basically destroyed during the last uh, decade. It's a country that managed um, still to hold elections, but a country like so many other democracies where there are deep disappointments, uh, where there's deep disaffection with out-of-touch governments, uh, with corrupt politicians, sluggish economies, grievances against big banks, uh, biased court decisions. Uh, there are still hopeful people, that's for sure. But the surveys that, um, if you look carefully at the most reliable surveys that are coming globally uh, to us, uh, show that um, these optimists are actually in a, min a, min a minority. There are, of course, people who shut their eyes and follow Machiavelli's observation that the road to hell is easy since it's downhill and you don't need, uh, you can keep your eyes shut. But I do think that we are living in Shakespearean times. Things are out of joint. Uh, a lot of strange things are happening that nobody had expected. And there's one agreement, I think, that runs through the variety of opinions, rather like um, uh, President Macron, that uh, democracies are not doing well, that things are going badly, much worse than anybody had expected. 
What I want to do um, in the next um, 25 minutes or so is kangaroo hop through um, probably seven points just to sort of set the scene um, for a discussion that I hope will break out, almost certainly it will, about how to understand this moment that we find ourselves in globally. A moment where um, democracy um, is not faring well and there are many analogies that can be drawn with the 1920s and 1930s. I think it is not a repeat of that period, but the out of joint times, the strange things that are happening are certainly analogous and there is growing anxiety about the fate of democracy. I'm not sure um, how we're going to click, but good, okay. Uh, I'll just signal. So that's disappointments. Perhaps we can go to the second. Oh, that's meant to be one before. Yes. Um, first point. To make sense of this period and the details that are, of course, variable in many contexts, I think, and I have tried to show at length in my work, requires a sense of history. Time really matters when it comes to democracy. It should be borne in mind that democracy is a very unusual political form, a way of life, because it produces disappointments. You know, mon monarchy has a set of rules for who governs and how transfers of power are decided. Sperm and blood. Democracies uh, stir things up. And the quintessence of a democracy is that it promises greater equality, the equalization of power among uh, living, breathing beings on earth. And the failure to bring about equalization produces disappointments, and there's very clearly uh, something like that going on, um, this sort of democratic disappointment. The disappointment principle is at work at the moment. But the point um, that's really important, this first point, is that uh, if you are ignorant about the past, if you ignore the past, then inevitably you misunderstand the present. And that has consequences for the way we think about the future. Uh, this is a maxim that many historians will emphasize. I've tried to write it in my work for many years, and I think it really is a principle that history matters that's very pertinent in these times. Secondly, I want to um, speak about uh, very briefly this very strange phrase, monetary democracy, not to be um, confused with monetary democracy. I have done talks where I get questions about monetary democracy, and it's, well, um, I've clearly uh, m m misrepresented my subject. What um, this phrase um, is about is that it's a challenge to some prevailing understandings of what has been going on in the world of so-named democracies in my lifetime. For example, you know, there's Frank Fukuyama's thesis that what we've been witnessing is a slow uh, victory of liberal democracy, American-style liberal democracy. I think this is a very mistaken view, just on descriptive grounds. Or there's Sam Huntington's third wave of democracy thesis, which says the really critical moment was in the early 1970s when um, Portuguese people, uh, together with the army, overthrew a dictatorship. Uh, I think that, too, doesn't get the timing right. And what I want to say, if you could um, perhaps just show um, uh, the next couple of slides, this is my party piece work of art, um, is that the critical period is the 1940s, uh, when the last great debate about the future of democracy happened, roughly between 1940 and 1950, in a period where there were many who feared that parliamentary representative democracy would not survive totalitarian rule, uh, two global wars, etc. And that debate spawned, in my view, looking at it carefully, a range of suggestions about how democracies could uh, be reborn and how they could flourish after the catastrophes of the first half of the 20th century. And it is in that period that when writing uh, this history of democracy, I began to notice that new institutions were born of this discussion of the 1940s, 
that never existed before in the history of democracy. And I began to scratch my head and wonder how to make sense of these. There are more than a hundred um, types of what I call monetary institutions. And to put it very simply, the whole idea of monetary democracy, it's not such a beautiful phrase, but it captures, uh, I think, this historical shift that began in the 1940s, was a reply to the standard model of representative democracy in state form that was uh, born at the end of the 18th century. And that model of democracy, which my grandparents uh, took not for granted, but which they understood, was a, a form of democracy where you, the centerpiece is periodic elections, where you have a multi-party system, you have freedoms of parties and citizens to mobilize in a civil society, you have periodic elections, you elect representatives to a legislature, to a parliament, and you either have a presidential or prime ministerial system, and all this takes place within um, a bureaucracy uh, structure, and of course it's covered by newspapers uh, and some radio and early television, and there are courts, and all this takes place within a given territorial state. So we refer to Canadian democracy or New Zealand democracy, British democracy, and so on. I think that um, the discussion of the 1940s and the institutions that were born thereafter is really important, uh, if we could have the next slide, monetary democracy, because one of the weaknesses, the central weakness of that old model that um, thinkers, journalists, politicians, citizens from left to right agreed in the 1940s. Its key weakness was that Hitler um, could actually come to power through periodic elections um, with enough um, mass support to destroy democracy. So the question uh, that became central was how to prevent elections and electoral outcomes being abused in the name of the people destroying um, democratic ideals and uh, the flanking institutions. And what was born, so I want to uh, say to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, citizens and citizenesses, is that this, um, it's quite complicated to, to uh, unpack, but what came um, to happen from the end of the 1940s through the 1950s, 1960s, and thereafter, is the redefinition of democracy. Democracy came to mean nothing less than free and fair elections, but something much more. And the something much more is the building and protection of institutions that try to bring greater accountability to power wherever it is exercised. And um, I call it monetary democracy. There's a long uh, story uh, about the choice of this phrase because from the Latin, um, to monitor uh, meant to warn about the dangers of uh, the abuse of power or to recommend certain positive courses of action. And so what happened from the end of the 1940s is that new institutions were built. Workers won the right to represent themselves on corporation uh, boards in Germany. It's called the Mitbestimmung system, and it's still uh, important. It was born as an attempt to prevent the return of fascism. Um, the marriage of human rights and democracy happened in the late 40s. Um, the UN Charter is a manifestation of this shift in which democracy gets redefined. Democracy is not majoritarian rule. That you know, leave, leaves whole polities open to Nazism. Democracy is when there are elected governments and rule of law uh, and there is respect for human rights. The first constitutions, the German and the Indian, 1950, are both uh, manifestations of this shift to monetary democracy. The idea is that an elected government cannot do things that are against the constitution and activist courts. So, um, democracy comes to be uh, redefined as nothing less than free and fair elections, but something much more, and that something much more is the building and protection of institutions uh, that are designed in the name of equality to prevent the abuse of power uh, by uh, elites uh, of minorities. And there are many 
um, watchdog, guide dog, barking dog institutions born of this period. I've mentioned uh, several. Um, they are not Western phenomena. For example, participatory budgeting is a Brazilian invention. Or uh, truth and reconciliation commissions. Um, it's a product of Central America, Jesuits, famously popularized in South Africa. You know, a, a, an institution which is not elected, and it's not about elections, it's about people speaking about apartheid and about the brutality of apartheid uh, without um, being arrested for uh, making confessions in public or weeping. Um, and I could elaborate this more, but I think, for instance, one last example, if, if you look at the greening of politics that's going on in every so-named democracy, um, none of this would have been possible without the birth of monetary mechanisms uh, like bioregional assemblies, citizen science networks that never existed before in the history of democracy. So this roughly is um, uh, the second point, and if we could have the third, we move to, to decadence. It's pretty clear, I think, that um, we are living in times where this monetary democracy its spirit, its language, its mechanisms are under tremendous uh, pressure. They're under siege, they're under assault, and there are various um, uh, uh, diagnoses of why this is and what is happening to actually uh, existing so-named democracies. One symptom of this is American political science. It may not be your cup of tea, but you know, once upon a time, the American political science establishment um, trumpeted, um, no pun intended, they trumpeted the triumph of liberal democracy. Uh, scholars like Larry Diamond, uh, for instance, um, and they even got involved in, for example, the attempt to uh, bring democracy to Iraq by force of arms. Larry Diamond was one of the consultants uh, for that. The change of tone is astonishing. There's talk of decline, Fall, Stephen Levitsky, Daniel Z. Blatt, uh, have published a book, How Democracies Die. Uh, so during the last 10 years, mainly in the last five, a whole shift in the zeitgeist, you know, a kind of um, melancholia, um, a real anxiety that what is going on in the United States, the world's largest, um, it's the richest, uh, most powerful democracy on the face of the earth, it is an empire, the anxiety is growing about um, uh, the fate of democracy in the United States. And there are uh, lots of um, data surfacing. For example, that um, less than 20% of Americans as of uh, a few months ago say they trust federal government. This is a complete you know, collapse of support for elected institutions and watchdog institutions that are supposed to protect um, American citizens. And of course, um, there is growing awareness that quite a lot of this disaffection with democracy, this disgruntlement, this anger, the feeling of being pissed off with things, has to do with the growth, um, the widening gap between rich and poor. Um, I met uh, just uh, yesterday uh, a scholar um, from Oxford who is an American politics expert who tells me that in the latest polls, 60% of Americans say they could not raise $400 if they had to uh, because of an emergency. That is the sign of a collapse of a middle class. Um, and um, this is something that the American scholars are increasingly worried about. There are, of course, um, so many um, forces that are driving, I think, this uh, disgruntlement, this uh, disaffection. Uh, and it leads uh, some scholars to say, David Runciman is one, the Cambridge uh, scholar, who says that um, American democracy, and I'm quoting, is in a miserable middle age period. I want to talk more about that organic metaphor that uh, sort of life cycle metaphor. I think it's deeply mistaken, but he basically says, yes, there's a lot of trouble in the house, of, in the body of democracy, but it's only a midlife crisis. Well, this is not, and he does go on to say, you know, in the end, it'll die. 
I mean, this is a, a strange way of thinking, but um, more about that in a moment. And it's also clear that um, democracies, us describing the symptoms, this decadence, democracies are losing their spirit, their, their belief that they can actually spread the spirit, the language, the institutions of democracy. I quote here uh, Mark Rutte, he's the Dutch Prime Minister, who recently um, acknowledged that the European Union's attempt to spread democracy, you know, beyond its boundaries is finished. Sometimes, he said, you have to dance with whoever's on the dance floor. He was re referring to al-Sisi in Egypt. You know, democracies actually have to get realistic, and that means dropping um, the mission uh, to democratize. This, I, I think, is, um, uh, is another symptom of this decadence. I'm at the moment with an Indian colleague writing a book about India, and if you want uh, to see a democracy in very bad shape, um, have a look at India. Um, the statistics are shocking. Uh, it is host to 14 of the world's most polluted cities. Uh, in eight states, there are more poor people than in the 26 countries of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. Studies consistently rank India as the most dangerous country uh, for women. This is a democracy. And a high court judge quite recently wept at a press conference where he said that such was the backlog of cases in Indian democracy that it would take 320 years to clear them. I mean, this is a sign of a dysfunctional democracy and as uh, people call it, the world's uh, largest. There are concerns about the impact of surveillance capitalism. It's one of your uh, topics in uh, this series. There are worries that there's a drift towards technocracy. Um, the hollowing out of political parties, mostly the disaffection with um, uh, politics, um, is a feature of this uh, developing uh, crisis. The concern about the poisoning of elections by dark money in uh, countries where there is virtually no regulation of uh, money, as in the United States, where it's considered to be free speech. Um, there are growing concerns about the permanent revolution that is damaging public services uh, in many democracies. You know, the politicization of the public service, um, the running down of the public service, that if you talk to senior public servants here, they will tell you that that is happening here and no democracy can survive in the long run without a functioning, um, well-trained, um, neutral as far as possible public uh, service. In some countries, um, we have um, the growth of militarized policing. We have rising rates of incarceration. And we have populism. And I come to my fourth topic. There has been a very big discussion uh, globally in the last four years or so about this uh, subject. We had a project in Sydney which uh, produced a lot of um, publications. And what I'm going to summarize to you is kind of what we learned about this phenomenon. Perhaps you'd like to introduce some of the figures. Um, yes, uh, slowly, not too fast. Uh, they all have one thing in common so far, a lot of hair. Uh, this is Beverly Gillo, uh, former comedian, um, the moving spirit of Five Star, uh, the Cinque Stella. Um, uh, a government that's now in crisis, um, and uh, next character, Hit Wilders, uh, famous for throwing um, media bombs, you know, mosques up spaces of terrorism, for instance. They're palaces of hate. Um, a populist, right-wing populist, another one, please. A man who's now forgotten, but, you know, in a way is the grandfather of all of this. He has hair thanks to a little bit of implantation, um, you know, he set the scene for this later populism that surfaced and um, we should keep going. Um, Taksin Shinawat, this is a global phenomenon. Now in exile, travels on eight passports um, and his um, sister has just been granted Serbian citizenship. Uh, she too is in exile. And um, Marine Le Pen, watch her because she's not finished in French politics uh, and there are plenty of French analysts of French politics who think that she has at least a fighting chance 
for the presidency. And if, if there's, I think there's, yeah, I want to just say a few things about this populism, just to kind of get the discussion going. What is this populism? It is something like an autoimmune disease of democracy in my interpretation. It belongs to democracy, and this is not the first time in the history of democracy that there has been populism. The last great uh, episode was from the end of the 19th century uh, until roughly World War I. Um, ancient Greek democracies worried about the same phenomenon of demagogues and who, who rise to power in the name of the people. But what do we mean technically by this term? Um, you can spot a populist because she or he will constantly mention the people. The, it's a mantra. It's a style of politics um, that claims to be acting in the name of the people. And because the people is an abstraction, you have to embody the people in human form, and that's the demagogue. Uh, that is the Shinawa. That is number 45. I don't use his name anymore. Uh, but the leader becomes the embodiment of this fictional body called the people. What populists do to get into office, to prepare the way, is of course they spread um, uh, a lot of what was called a couple of years ago post-truth. Um, bullshit, it's a technical term. Um, lies. Uh, they're silent about certain things. They poison public life. They say outrageous things to loosen things up and stretch um, the boundaries of what is tolerated. And much of that is toxic. What is really important, as I see it, is that this populism is an attack on monetary democracy. What it wants to do is to simplify democracy so that it comes to mean um, the free and fair election which you win. And that's why all populists attack um, journalism, fake news. That's why they attack the courts, flanking institutions that try to restrain elected governments. They attack experts. Um, number 45 has you know, it attacked the National Football League. He's attacked the Boy Scouts of America. He's attacked Google. You know, any institution, watchdog, barking dog institution that wants to criticize uh, the populist demagogue gets it. Uh, and in that sense, um, it's extremely dangerous for monetary democracy. Um, if, of course, getting its hands on uh, state power is important, uh, using those resources. Uh, part of the logic, it's essential to populism, is that there's a lot of in-grouping that goes on. Oh yes, we're going to drain the swamps. Have a look at the first cabinet that number 45 appointed. You know, it's the highest concentration of billionaires uh, in the history of the American Republic. In-grouping is necessary. You know, Nigel Farage has his mates, you know, at Weatherspoon, and he has hedge fund operators because you need money to get elected and you need to have a kind of flanking you know, business backup to what you're doing. By definition, populism involves outgrouping. Uh, the targets depend on the context, but you designate a group that does not belong to the people. And here is the strange, uh, this is Eric Trump, the son of number 45. The only thing that matters is the unification of the people because other people don't mean anything. It's a very strange sentence. But in other words, there's my people, there's the pure people, and then there are those others, Muslims, gays, liberals, Latinos, it depends on the context, um, who don't belong and therefore are targeted with abuse and um, often uh, with threats of violence. The aesthetics of violence is, I think, intrinsic to populism. Um, the condoning of violence um, and the violent talk is part of uh, its outgrouping. Uh, of course, the outgrouping involves um, uh, emphasizing the importance of the sovereign state. Uh, they want to weaken 
these institutions that get in the way of governing a people within a territory. And finally, one quality, I think, of all of the populism that I've studied and historically is um, this is um, uh, uh, Krause, Enrique Krause, who is a Mexican writer who has written a fabulous book on um, redemption. And he says, you know, what the mark of all populists is that they, they promise, you know, a kind of redemption on earth. They have a kind of apostolic zeal about them. And um, the point here is that uh, populism is only possible under democratic conditions. You have to have freedom of assembly and the freedom to form a party and so on. But in practice, it tends to destroy the spirit, the language, the institutions of democracy, which helps explain why, for example, uh, there is no active populist movement in China, uh, because you need those civil freedoms in order to have uh, democracy. Fifth point, um, if, if I may, um, and I've lost time, but I have um, a very strict timekeeper here. I want to say something about uh, the left. Um, I'm not sure whether you, what you think of yourselves, center, left, right, uh, but I do think that this is a period in which the old left-right division and all of its nuances is important to reflect upon. Partly because every democracy, when it's robust, has got to have space within it um, for people to form new policies, to agree on strategies, and to disagree with their opponents. This um, distinction between left and right, of course, is a product of the French Revolution, and I can't go into it in any detail. But the reason I put it on the table here tonight is because um, our friend Francis Fukuyama, who is about to appear and who I have debated three or four times uh, here in Australia, has recently written about this topic of the left. And he basically says, you know, the left in America has been outflanked um, by number 45's populism. And why? Because it concentrated on minorities. You know, it was concerned with ecological values and it was concerned with hashtag me too and it concerned with um, LGBTI uh, rights and so on, the rights of uh, uh, black uh, citizens and their, the trampling of their rights. The trouble is, says Fukuyama, this allowed um, the white, predominantly male middle class and lower middle class to feel left out and so attracted, magnetized, by number 45, and that, says Fukuyama, is happening in more than a few uh, countries. What is to be done? He says the left needs to drop all of that, and it needs, I'm putting it a little bit crudely, but it's the message, you can find a lot of it online, uh, the message is that what the left has to do in order to win back and to defeat populism is um, to embrace nationalism. So it's, it's got to start talking about the reunification of the nation. And um, this is very strange, uh, really, for, uh, I think, when you look at um, Fukuyama's writings. It's certainly bad news uh, for Muslims. It's bad news uh, for women. It's bad news for anybody who has particular interests that they've been championing. What he wants to say is that, you know, all of that chitter-chatter has kind of got to stop and there needs to be a unifying ethic, um, this attachment to uh, the nation. I think that um, that's bad news also for Europe, uh, because effectively he's calling into question um, European integration. Uh, and, well, I could uh, elaborate, but that we can do in discussion. So if that line of thinking is to be um, uh, refused, what might it mean to be on the left in these times? Um, is there an ecumenical understanding of what it means to be on the left? The, di the distinction left-right, as you know, is a product of the French Revolution. And to put it very, very, very simply, through the course of the 19th century, the left believed in industrial progress, scientific, technological innovation, it believed in equality. Um, it believed in leveling 
institutions like the church, um, landed property. It believed in democracy and it did all of this in opposition to the right who dragged their feet, who were in favor of hierarchy, they were in favor of organized uh, religion, the Catholic Church for instance, and they were generally conservative about everyday life and had a great fear of the people. This was a dynamic that played itself out, as you know, uh, through the 19th century. It was bound up with the struggle for one person, one vote, which was vigorously opposed by the right in so many uh, contexts. But the strange thing, when you look at the genealogy of this left-right distinction, is the way it becomes increasingly scrambled in the last century. I'd say the turning point is roughly World War I, where um, the strange thing is that the right, Mussolini, Franco, Hitler, all the way through to Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and number 45, are now the great champions of neoliberal economic progress and modernization. And the left has often become rather shy of um, blind modernization. Think about the ecological questions. There was a battering of the left because of Stalinism. Uh, the left became associated, socialism became associated with totalitarian state. Um, and um, things weren't improved by the Cultural Revolution, by Tiananmen Square. Um, the left suffered great reputational damage through all of this. And so too um, did the, the emergence of national um, communist regimes, Yugoslavia, China, Vietnam, uh, for instance, that even uh, were engaged in rivalries. The birth of a new left at the end of the 1950s further complicates the whole uh, matter. Uh, and I would say, it's a harsh remark, some of you will uh, find it too harsh, that I think new Labour parties uh, in the 90s came to be, um, in some context, associated with a kind of neoliberal ethic of, you know, uh, further economic progress and um, trickle-down economic and so on. And when um, the near collapse of the banking and credit system happened in 2007 and 2008, um, got their fingers uh, burned. So it's become something of a mess. And I um, want now uh, almost penultimately to move to um, how we might rethink, uh, I think we're ahead of ourselves, uh, but uh, how we might rethink, I think we need to go back to hope if we could. Is there any hope? Oh, I went missing. Ah, oh, damn. Okay, so point number six. Um, what might it mean to be on the left? I think central, uh, it's a conjecture, put it on the ground, central is the attachment to democracy. And by democracy I mean, yes, self-government of people through elected representatives, through fair and free elections, cleaning up elections, rebuilding parties, very important part of what it means to be on the left. But the defense and the building of monetary institutions that prevent the abuse of power, because the abuse of power is the destruction of the equality principle. When a few rule and bully others, uh, this is anti-democratic. So, for instance, uh, in recent weeks in South Korea, a law has been passed, it will soon be applied to all workplaces to prevent bullying. That is, that's an innovation and it will be monitored by an independent body uh, and of course there will be court cases, but it's an example of um, the kind of innovation that's badly needed in these times or so I think. To be on the left is to defend um, a plurality of forms of life it seems to me that one of the really worrying things about populism, deeply worrying, is its monomaniacal quality. You know, in the name of the people, it does things and it overrides um, opponents. To be on the left is uh, to defend different ways of life, and that means multiculturalism. That means, of course, building institutions like, let's say, a federal anti-corruption commission, or let's say, uh, for the first time for several decades, enabling uh, our indigenous peoples to have institutions whereby they can represent themselves in public life and monitor uh, what goes on in Canberra and elsewhere. 
The ethic of humility I've tried to write about at length because it seems to me central to the whole redefinition of um, the left as uh, democratic. Uh, of course, it um, has implications for cross-border relations of power. Of course, one of the great questions it seems to me facing the left seen in this way is how to extend monetary mechanisms into areas like the banking and credit uh, sector. Uh, we are living in a very unusual phase of capitalism. It's um, financialized. It began roughly in around 1970, and we know it's risk prone. Uh, there is a great uh, history of bubbles in the financial and credit sectors by um, Charles Kindleberger and a co-author, a German-American historian, who shows that since the Dutch tulip craze of 1603 or 4, there have been 11 major burst bubbles in the history of modern capitalism globally, and seven have happened since 1970. And if you look at IMF figures, there have been something like 250 burst bubbles uh, since that period. And we have not witnessed the last of them. So we have built in, uh, in other words, to so named democracies, a sector of the economy that is largely self regulating. Uh, central banks' job is not to rein them in and to prevent risk taking. And yet, it's exactly that sector that's highly risky. And if bubbles burst, then millions of people's uh, lives are damaged. Finally, hope. Uh, it doesn't appear. Uh, but I want to say something about uh, hope. You know, hope is a four-letter word that has been given a lot of bad press um, by philosophers for quite a long time. Uh, Nietzsche, uh, the 19th century uh, German anti-philosopher, uh, said that um, hope is a bit like a rainbow that cascades over life. Aristotle, going back even further, thought it was uh, hope is a waking uh, dream. A lot of jokes are made about hope. You know, like the old one that it's always hard to feel hope with a hangover. Uh, there is, um, however, I think, in the work that I'm doing now, I think this is a period in which hope um, is very important for not only keeping alive but to nurture. What is hope? Hope is not belief in miracles. It's not rainbows of the mind. Hope has a pragmatic quality. Hope is the wish and the belief that things can become better on the basis of what we have now. Uh, it's not abstract, um, wishful thinking. And in this uh, sense, of course, hope is a gamble. It can result in disappointment and melancholia and deep sadness. But what is, I think, interesting is, and almost nothing is written on this, is the close connection between democracy and hope. And I'm going to finish almost on this. A very close affinity uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, in action, when the spirit of democracy takes root in a family, in a community, in a workplace, in elections, in cross-border settings, in environmental politics, when it takes root, it stirs up the sense of contingency of power relations. What do I mean by that? It stirs up the sense that things that are now are not necessarily so, could be changed, things could be different in the future. It's one of the distinctive features of democracy. The first person, I think, to point this out was Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French aristocrat who got converted to democracy and wrote one of the great texts in the history of democracy called Democracy in America, who pointed out, for example, uh, when observing women in the United States circa 1830, that if the spirit of democracy is about equalization of power and denaturing power, uh, that power is no longer seen as God-given or fixed in stone, written into the nature of things, then he remarked that um, the inequalities between men and women could not survive the democratic revolution, as he put it. Because the question would be raised, how come more than half the population is not considered equal. And I think that's a very profound remark, and we should remember it, and it is the basis, I think, of um, uh, hope, because democracy is a kind of twin of hope in this respect. It enables hopes to surface. Democracy also 
protects a pluralism of hopes. You know, um, we have different hopes. We hope that the sun will shine in Melbourne tomorrow, uh, that the morning train will get you to work, uh, that your friends are going to meet you in the evening. We have hopes for a decent paying job, for promotion. We have hopes for a better world for our children, and so on. Um, democracies have enough space within them when they work well for a pluralism of hopes. And that's true also for people of faith who have different understandings of what hope is. Or it's also capacious enough, I think, to include uh, space for Buddhists who actually um, aren't much interested in hope or don't much like hope because it encourages attachment to worldly things rather than seeking um, uh, life uh, hereafter. There's a third affinity between democracy and hope. Um, we always, usually think of hope as to do with the future, but hopes can also be remembering things. And there are societies, democracies, that have at least still some life in them that enable uh, memories to be revived and to circulated. That is fundamental for our country. Uh, the remembrance of things past through institutions uh, that are weak uh, is vital for creating a sense among indigenous peoples that they belong on the land which is theirs. Uh, if the past is expunged, if it's forgotten, then that does damage to the hopes of uh, some people. And finally, um, democracy has a close affinity, I think, with hope because it has built-in early warning detectors. When a monetary democracy works well, there are whistleblowers. It's one of your topics. Uh, there are watchdog institutions and barking dog institutions that warn against the foolishness of those who are making uh, decisions. And in particular, I think, democracy is a kind of um, uh, protector against grand hopes for the nation, for the people, uh, for the market. You know, these are grand ideologies, big stories that certainly are the carriers of hope, but in practice, in the past and in the present, do damage to democracy. So democracies contain early warning detector systems about uh, such hopes. I want finally to end and not overstay my welcome by saying just in a minute or two that this is a period, I think, uh, if this very roughly presented um, description and diagnosis of the question of whether democracies are dying, I haven't answered it yet, um, I think it's a period in which um, the old-fashioned questions about what's so good about democracy need to be revisited. You will be shocked or surprised uh, to find that in the history of democracy there has been um, a very large handful of justifications of democracy. Um, and I'm not including the justifications that say democracy is good because it enables people to govern themselves. This is a tautology. You know, democracy is good. Democracy understood as self-government of the people is good because the people govern themselves. This, I think, is a common... Oh, students love to say it in Politics 100, but it doesn't work. In the history of democracy, there have been some strange justifications, and I want just to um, run through them and then stop and suggest uh, a novel justification of democracy in these times. Um, in Athens, you will find there, were no, there was no democratic thinker. Um, the philosophers, Plato and so on, were anti-democrats. But from the surviving poems and plays and poetry and, and uh, speeches, uh, what circulated in Athens is that democracy is good because it makes we Athenians militarily strong. This is very strange. It was an empire. Uh, it's a very strange justification, revived by George W. Bush, by the way. You know, we take democracy to Iraq uh, because democracy is good, because um, it enables, you know, America to fight well and to bring democracy to Iraq. Um, there have been many uh, theological justifications of democracy. Uh, I looked in particular at the anti-slavery movement um, in the early uh, period of representative democracy. 
And if you f uh, look at the pamphlets where democracy is discussed, it's the first great social movement of modern times across the Atlantic, you will find in almost all the pamphlets that democracy is praised because it's a God-given ideal. And you read a page and you see that, alas, it's a Christian ideal, and a little bit further, it's a Protestant ideal. That's very bad news for Catholics and Muslims and Jews and so on. It doesn't really work, although, uh, you know, democracies have space for people to talk like this. Um, the 19th century argument was that um, God gave us nations, and nations are like large families, and naturally um, there is a tendency towards uh, national self-determination, and uh, only democracy can uh, bring that about, and democracy equals national self-determination. That produced um, a couple of global wars, uh, and it's not, uh, it lost its momentum. There are those who say that democracy brings us truth, um, we could talk about that at some length. Uh, that's John Stuart Mill, it's Karl Popper. There are those who think that history guarantees democracy. In his hardest moments, Frank Fukuyama argued like that in the famous essay of uh, the spring of 1989, where he claimed that American-style liberal democracy, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, it showed that liberal democracy was now a universal ideal without competitors. This has come to be extremely uh, uh, questionable. There are what are called um, consequentialist arguments. You know, democracy brings economic growth. The Chinese model shows that that's not necessarily the case. Or there, are, there was in the 1990s the thesis that democracies never go to war with each other. That's not true for Athens. It was at war in the latter several decades of its life, it was at war every year. Um, there are those who have said that it promotes education um, in the sense of widening of horizons, and the widening of horizons makes for better and more intelligent people. John Dewey. I think um, we are living in times, and here I end on this uh, note, um, citizens and citizenesses. Uh, I think that if you look back through the history of democracy and if you extrapolate and begin to think uh, more deeply, you will see um, that in the 1940s, the last great discussion of democracy, the central argument that was made for democracy was this last one. Um, C.S. Lewis, you may have read um, some of his children's tales, the great Irish writer, put it like this. He said, 1943, bombs raining down on London, where he is at that moment. He said, Democrats until now have thought that human beings are good enough to govern themselves and that it's a good way of um, handling power. Lewis added, I think that's not true. And he's referring, of course, to Hitler and Stalin. And he says, here on, democracy needs to, the argument for democracy needs actually to be sort of flipped on its head so that democracy comes to mean a way of handling power through institutions in the name of flesh and blood people who are treated as equals or can become equals, a way of handling power that prevents its abuse. And for that to happen, you have to have these watchdog barking dog institutions, these monetary institutions, to prevent the abuse of power. I fear very much, I don't know your uh, uh, sentiments, they're about to surface, but I fear very much the times that we've entered because um, instances of the abuse of power are rising. And um, the destruction of democratic institutions um, is the destruction of barriers against that abuse of power. So the evils of arbitrary power, power exercised arbitrarily, seems to me to be the um, great new argument for democracy. And it means that it applies in cross-border settings as much as it does in the workplace, as much as it does in the family, as much as it does in elections, as much as it does in courts. And it might sound strange at a Fabian meeting to end um, with a reference to uh, Winston Churchill, Churchill, bless him. But you may know that in 1947 he stood up in a very bad mood uh, discussing Labour's legislation 
uh, where he um, spat venom at the Labour government saying, you know, we fought a war against um, the Nazis and now we've got, you know, Nazism taking root in Britain. If you forgive him for that, he was ill and certainly bad-tempered on that day. There is a sentence or two in that speech where he says, um, you've heard it before, you know, many ways of uh, governing have been invented. Um, democracy is not perfect, but it's the least worst form of handling power so far that we've invented. And that was in that 1940s period, and it seems to me that that um, last dark moment in our recent history of democracy is the moment where this argument first crystallizes, and it seems to me that it remains highly relevant. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, not falling asleep and looking very interested, and I'm very curious to hear your reactions. Thank you very much.